time to get into God's word. Thanks again for being here today. Would you do me a favor and put your hands together for those who are joining us online. God bless you guys. Thank you for worshiping with us. I know a lot of you are traveling. So happy for the internet so that you could get to be a part of what God's doing here this morning. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. And Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place this morning to have your will in our hearts and our minds to remind us of the great joy of Christmas and the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you do that which only you could do? Would you open our eyes and open our ears to hear and see exactly what you have in store for each of us? Would you give us the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives? Father, as we talk about leaving a legacy, would it be something that we all desire to do? Leaving a godly legacy to the next generation in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. So we're here this Christmas Eve to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before we unwrap all the gifts, we are going to be wrapping up a message series that we've been doing here at Journey for a few weeks called This Is Us. It's really been a series on the family. We've been talking about our families. We've been talking about what it means to go from being an infant to a child, from a child to a young adult, from a young adult to a parent, and then being a grandparent. So we've been talking about some things in the natural and we've been drawing some spiritual analogies to those things as well. So I don't know what age bracket you're in or where you're at in terms of this portion of the life cycle, but I can tell you a few things. You had some awesome, cute little kids up there. So many of you are at that phase where you got some cute kids and it's always so fun. You know, part of what makes it fun with those things is the kids that cut up. Come on, Jesus. Mine was one of them back in the day, right? Doesn't that just make it special, make it real? We're all part of the family. If you're here and you're an adult and you have some teenagers, I assure you, you will survive in Jesus' name. You will get past that era. You will get through it. And then one day, Lord willing, you'll get to be grandparents. And then whenever the kid cuts up, you just give them back to their parents. Come on, Jesus, right? So there's some good phases that we go through as part of that. Every one of them enjoyable. Every one of them, you know, rife with opportunity to grow. So really we make these natural analogies, but we're really talking about some spiritual things. If you're a fan of the show in any way, uh, you'll notice that that show This Is Us, there's a lot of challenges in that family that they express, right? Some of which don't really line up with God's word as part of it. And there's good and bad in every family. Would you agree? And I think one of the things that we maybe learned during the course of this series, when you really look at it, your family's not all that messed up. Come on, right? When you start to compare it to us, well, some some of y'all, you know, like, you you know what I'm saying? Um, Like ours, right? My family's messed up. Your family's messed up. That's part of life and the sinfulness and the fallenness of this world is that we have challenges and there's real pains and difficulties and we have to try to figure things out in Christ. But when we get to the essence of all that we've been talking about, Jesus is the hope of the world. There's a hope that's found in this baby that was born in a stable in Bethlehem that brings hope to us all. See, that's where we can find our center. That's where our families can be rebuilt. That's where we can experience the kind of life that only comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Brings us to today. So let's start maybe at the youngest among us. So I had a couple of um, opportunities this week to go into the hospital um, through the generosity of some of our members here at Presented Journey with a wonderful opportunity where we were able to give every single child in the neonatal ICU unit and their families gifts for Christmas. Give God a little bit of glory. Isn't that absolutely amazing? Just amazing. We're going to go deliver the remainder of them after service. So just, it it was awesome, but we got to go there and see the kids in the hospital. And, you know, I forget oftentimes, or I guess I stand in awe every time. If you have a baby and you see me awing at them, I just still love that stage. I'm always enamored when you look at them and their little teeny feet and their little teeny hands. And there's something so special and innocent and beautiful in the life of a child. And then we got to see some of the, the premature babies that were in there and how little they really are. Oh my goodness. And praise God, may they grow up really fast, especially those kids that were sick. And when you think of sickness though, and it, it's not supposed to be that way, is it? See, that's what sin brought into the world. The pain of the sinfulness of this life. No child is supposed to be in the hospital. They're not supposed to be in there when their parents leave, right? 
It reminded me of my own life when uh, Mary Jo and I had that experience with Molly. Molly was in the hospital as a baby and she didn't get to go home with us. And I remember how terrifying it was. They had to put the IV in through her head. So they had the little IV in her head and it was very scary for us as parents. But even in the midst of those challenges, when you look at a brand newborn baby, come on, it is something so special, so beautiful. There's so much hope that's wrapped up in that moment. How much more so when you think of a baby that might have been the king of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the savior of all mankind. How awesome is that? How wonderful it would be to meet him. And in fact, if you've not met him, hopefully you've began to experience him here today. See, he's not a fable. He's not a story tell, you know, told uh, like we just experienced with the kids' production. It's wonderful, but it's a story that was real. It really happened, and it changed the course of all history and changes the course of all eternity, and it changes your course and mine as well. You see, there was a prophet named Isaiah that many years before Jesus' birth prophesied that one day he would come. He said it in these words, Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born. You know who that us is? That's you. That's me. That's us, for unto us a child is born. This child was born so that you and I could be a part of his family. For us, a son is given. It's a free gift that God presented to each and every one of us. The government shall rest upon his shoulders. We can't forget the fact that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is worthy to be worshipped. He is worthy to be adored. He is worthy to be praised. He is also one that should be feared if you are not living in accordance with his word, right? We forget these things sometimes. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. He is our king. He is our Lord. That's why we're here today, to remember that day and to put things into perspective. You know, Mary Jo hinted a little bit about traditions, and that's really where I want to go with today. I want to talk about leaving a legacy. No matter your age in here, there's a legacy that you're going to leave. What footprint are you going to leave here on this earth? How are you going to pass the gospel on to those who come after you? It's an important question that we need to be studying. It's an important question that we need to be applying in our lives. So traditions are very important in our family. We like to create an atmosphere, and Mary Jo does an incredible job of this, of, you know, just a place where our family would want to come and be there on those holidays and have Christ at the center of those. Now, if I were honest, some traditions are good and some traditions are bad, right? So some things we do just out of route routine, right? They're not always good and we don't even know why we do those things. Those kinds of traditions are not the ones that I'm talking about. Some of those need to be discarded. Many of you, if you've been around church circles for a while, you might have heard this story, but let me share a little story with you for purposes of illustration. It's Christmas time. How many of you are gonna have a Christmas ham at the table tomorrow night, right? I'm not going to y'all's house. I don't know what's wrong with you. Y'all need to have that traditional Christmas ham. So a young woman is preparing the Christmas ham while her friends look on. She cuts both ends, prepares it and puts it in the pan. Why do you cut off the ends? Her friend asks. I don't know. She replies. My mother always did it that way. And I learned how to cook from her. Her friend's question made her curious about her ham preparation. During the next visit home, she asked her mother, how do you cook the Christmas ham? Her mother proceeded to explain and added, you cut off both ends, prepare it, put it in the pot, and then into the oven. Why do you cut off both ends, the daughter said. Baffled, her mother offered, that's how my mother did it, and I learned from her. Her daughter's inquiry made the mother think all the more about the question. When she next visited her mother in the nursing home, she asked, Mom, how do you cook the Christmas ham? The mother slowly answered, thinking in between sentences, well, you prepare it with spices, you put brown sugar on it, and then you cut off both ends and put it into the pot. The mother asked, but why do you cut off both ends? The grandmother's eyes sparkled as she remembered, well, the hams were always bigger than the pot that we had back then. I had to cut off the ends so that it would fit into the pot. 
sometimes you gotta think about, you know. So there's some traditions that make sense, and if you've got a bigger pot, that one doesn't make sense anymore, right? Maybe you got a little bigger oven than she did back in the day, you know. So some things make sense and other things don't, right? But there's some traditions that are well worth passing on to the next generation. We're a family here at Journey Church. So as I said, Mary Jo tries to create an environment um, where not just for our family, but even for the greater family here at Journey Church, she always tries to make these many days special. We got a little bit of a glimpse of that as Lila was thinking about what was coming up with some of the Christmas things that we were doing. We got to go to Sweet Pete's the other night and experience Christmas there, and this is what was on her heart as she was thinking about that Christmas time. Well, I can't wait. We're going to have the best time ever together. My cousins come in, my little brothers come in, and I will be there too. Are you so excited? Because I was going so crazy because I was super, super, super excited. I love you. That's a glimpse of our family to yours. She's super excited. Wouldn't we be that way? Every time we gather together as believers, not just at Christmas, would we be excited to experience God's presence? Would be excited to talk about him and what he's done in our life? Would he be the great joy of our lives? Would we experience him each and every day? Times like this are wonderful, but I'm here to tell you he wants to bring joy to every day of your life, not just the Christmas season. But we have these opportunities that we're presented with, like today. I've shared about my Aunt Jeannie in previous Christmas years where she always made a big, big Christmas party for the entire family to come over on Christmas Eve. It was wonderful. It was special. But we always got there before her because she was at church with her kids. She made it a point that no matter what, she was going to be in church somewhere, just like you guys are this morning. What a great Christmas tradition that you're already creating by being here. Wherever you find yourself in future years, make that a priority. Maybe you're in the Navy and you get transferred to another city. It doesn't matter. Wherever you're at, each and every Christmas, do it the same way that you did it this year. Show your children, show your family, show the next generation what really matters to you. Maybe you're even on on vacation somewhere, would you tell them, guess what? I don't care about the party for just a minute. We are going to church. We're going to be with other believers. Let them know what really matters to you. So we're moving through these life stages, right? From childhood to parenthood, maybe to grandparenthood, leaving a legacy. I have to say the Jewish people have done an incredible job with this. Half of my family's Jewish. Um, we've had the opportunity to go to Israel a few times. But one of the most defining moments of me understanding this in their lives and culture did not happen when we were in Israel. It happened when we were on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. We were down there one year, and I remember seeing an Orthodox Jewish family um, from the oldest. The oldest person in there was in a wheelchair, and the youngest was actually helping wheel them around and being very attentive to them. Grandpa, uh, Abba, Father, wh- how are you? And they were guiding them up and down the boardwalk that was there, and all the family was walking with them, and they put the priority on being there. You know, sometimes in our culture, sadly, as we get a little bit older, sometimes people perceive us to be a burden rather than a blessing, right? And they didn't see it in that way. They were t- teaching every generation to honor the previous one. And then the elders were there sowing into their lives. And they have these great traditions that sometimes we lack in America, like bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs that help people understand these rites of passage and understanding of the Jewish culture, right? They do an incredible job, even in my own family, of passing on the history of the Jewish culture, but oftentimes they don't do the greatest job of passing on the religion aspect, so to speak, or they get very religious about it rather than a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So just like I said, in everything, there's some good and there's potentially some bad, but how did they do it? How did they begin to instill these kinds of values that are worth passing on to the next generation? Where did it begin? One of the places in scriptures that you see this is found in Deuteronomy chapter six. It's one of my favorite sets of verses of all time. It's one of my favorite passages. I all often, all too often go back to it, but listen to how they began to accomplish this. Listen to where their focus was. Listen to what was important to them. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. I think every one of us as believers wants to apply that, do we not? Don't you want God to be at the center of your life and your relationships and your family? But don't we forget sometimes also, if we're honest, how does it drift? Where does it go astray? So he starts out with this ideal state. And then he begins to give us some solutions of how we keep God there at the center of our universes. He says this, you shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be at the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts and on the gates of your house. So he says that this should be the center of conversation. Not that the Jaguars are winning the playoffs, which is all too cool this year. They're going into the playoffs. That's an awesome thing. He's saying, you know, this shouldn't be at the center. Those things are fun. But the most important thing he's saying is that God would be at the center of your family. See, they would physically inscribe this set of verses, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and put it inside of a thing called the mezuzah that would be on the outside of their house, on the doorpost when they would go in. You would see a Jewish person often touch that as they walk in or out of the house as a reminder of this keeping Jesus first and foremost in their relationship every single day. How awesome would that be if you knew the word, you talked the word, you had a devotional time. How incredible is that? And this next year, we're gonna give you a ton of tools as we go through the Bible systematically in an epic fashion from beginning to end during the course of 2018. We're gonna help you and your families be able to apply these words in a powerful, powerful way. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. I pray that you come back and be a part of what God is doing in that. Now we talked about tradition sometimes being good and tradition sometimes being bad. See, we're not talking about religion here, we're talking about relationship. So sometimes the Jewish people get it a little weird as well. Um, going to the Wailing Wall in Israel, you get to go to that Western Wall, and as you walk up, there'll be a group of Orthodox Jews that'll be sitting there by the side, and for every male that walks up, they will tell you, are you Jewish? For every female that walks up, they'll say, you gotta go over there to a different place to pray. They separate the men and the women for that time of prayer, but they'll ask you if you're Jewish. And if you respond that you're Jewish and you don't want to put on a kippah and you don't want to put this box with scripture between your eyes, the frontlets of your eyes, and you don't want to have a leather strap and put it on you, they will guilt you big time. I mean, they will, they're literally there positioning it. As Jewish people walk up, they'll go give them this little thing. They put the box on their head, the scripture between the frontlets of their eyes. Sometimes that gets just a little weird. Come on, Jesus. I mean, it gets a little bit like what we were talking about with the ham. They were after the letter of the law when, after, when God was actually after something different. He was after their hearts. He wanted to be at the center of their hearts and the center of their minds and the center of their homes. He wasn't talking about some physical external thing. He was talking about what he wanted to do inside of them. In verse 10, and when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you with great and good cities that you did not build and houses full of all the good things that you did not fill and cisterns that you did not dig and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and when you are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. There's some important things that we need to remember there. Every one of us at one time was a slave to sin. Every one of us. Some of us are still stuck in that struggle that are right here in this room. It's okay, but there's freedom, there's hope. God wants to change you, he wants to transform you, he wants to set you free. But he also says there's this symptom that occurred in their culture that seems to often occur in American culture too, where when things are going good, we have this tendency to forget about the God who made them good, right? We tend to think and put too much um, health and understanding in our own power rather than in the power of God who got us there. We think we've got it under control rather than him being at the center of all those things. None of us are guilty of ever doing that. I'm raising my hand first, right? <laughs> we do it. It's a built-in natural tendency of humanity. And he's saying part of the remedy of that is if you'll put him first, if you'll make him the center of your house, if you get up and you pray and you seek his face and you become part of the life of the body, there's great joy and freedom and blessing in the house of the Lord. 
So how do we spiritually, as mature spiritual adults, begin to leave a legacy? We put these verses that we've been studying into practice in our everyday lives. As fun as Santa might be, as fun as all the lights and Christmas trees might be, as fun as the hustle and bustle, except on Blanding Boulevard, might be, <laughs> if you put God first, I'm telling you, there'll be peace. What a beautiful time we're presented with at Christmas time. Maybe you haven't been putting these verses into practice. What a great jump start. We talk about traditions and we talked about going to churches you already have. When you're there with your kids tomorrow, for those of you who have kids or your grandkids, would you remember these stories? Would you remind them of the reason for the season that it's not about all the gifts that are under the tree? It's about the king of the universe who came to save all mankind. You could share with them some verses. Yeah, you're welcome to clap about that. You could share with them some verses like we just read earlier tonight and that the kids sung just a moment ago. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Remind them that it's Jesus that's the center of this season. Remind them that it's Jesus each and every day that sustains your family. It's Jesus that leads you through the dark places and also through the precious moments of life. That he'll never leave you or forsake you. That he loves you and it starts with this new born king. You might even fast forward to the book of Luke chapter 2 starting in verse 8. The kids read it just a moment ago. I'll repeat it. It's an awesome set of scriptures. In the same region there were shepherds out there in the field. You saw them going ba, ba, ba with the sheep next to them, right? <laughs> Keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I think we forget that sometimes. You got to fear the Lord. He's the creator of the universe. How dare we as mere human beings created from the dust of the earth say, I ignore you, God. No, might we worship him. And the angel said to him, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God and the highest and peace among those with whom he is pleased. See, that is the essence of Christmas. A baby born in a manger who is the savior of all mankind. A baby that would go on to become a teenager, a sinless teenager. Can you imagine such a thing? Right? He grew up to be a sinless teenager teenager and moved on to being an adult who walked in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit who was fully God and fully man who came to die a sinner's death on a tree that you and I might become part of his family. He loved you that much that he would send his one and only begotten son from heaven to earth to show us the way. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We thank you for good news of great joy that is for all the people. As we gather together here as a faith family this morning, Lord, it is such a blessing to see friends old and new, to take part in worshiping you. From the first song and notes that we sang, we pray that everything that was done today would bring you glory. Glory do a king, the king of the universe. Lord, we thank you for the moments that we had where we worshiped you in song. We thank you for the opportunity to lay our gifts at your feet and say, Lord, we trust you in every area of our life. We thank you for the great joy of experiencing Christmas through the eyes of children, hearing their voices sing, what hope it brings. Lord, what a blessing it is to be here today. Father, yet I know there may be some who are in here who are struggling. There may be some who were dragged in this place as I once was. And so grateful I am that at one point someone dragged me into a church. It changed my life. It changed my destiny. It set me on fire. It gave me a life meaning. 
And most of all, I was forgiven that I could get to experience joy everlasting with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and worship him forever. Maybe you walked through this door and you wouldn't call yourself a believer, but right now God is doing something in your heart. You sense a tingling and an acknowledgement that he is who he says he is, and you're ready to join his family. For others at Journey, we certainly believe your salvation is secure. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your destiny is heaven. But as you gaze on and reflect back on what this year has been, you realize that maybe you've done a little drifting. God's always been there and he's waiting with open arms like the story of the prodigal son. He wants you to come home, but you've been out there trying to do it on your own and maybe it's not working out all that well and he's brought you to this moment today where you know that you know that today's a day where you need to rededicate your life to him. You need to say, God, I need you. Forgive me for trying to go at it on my own. From this day forward, I will live for you. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I would ask you that question. Is today the day that you want to surrender your life to Jesus or maybe is today a day of rededication? If it is, I would love to pray with you. If you'd do me a favor and just raise your hand right where you're at with nobody looking around, I see your hand, sir. Praise God. I see your hand. Thank you, Lord. I see your hand, sir. Thank you, Lord. I see your hand in the back and yours in the back as well. Keep it up there so I can see it. I'm getting a little older. I can't see that well anymore. Thank you, Lord. I see your hand. Praise God. Father, we thank you and praise you. Lord, we stand overjoyed that your word continues to be true. That, Father, as people have raised their hand, we join with them, Lord God, as they dedicate their life to you this very day. And we reaffirm our own faith. We say that Jesus... We truly believe the things that we talked about today, that you were born of the Virgin Mary, that you were immaculately conceived, that you were born in a stable in Bethlehem, that you went on to live a sinless, spotless life, and that, Father, you were willing to send your very only son to a tree on Golgotha where he would be crucified for our sins, where he would die in our place for our sins, that we might have life that we might be freed, that we might get to experience the kind of joy that you had intended for us in the first place. So today, acknowledging all those things, we say that Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again, that we might have life. And we submit our hearts and our minds to you. Father, we submit them to you and we ask you to forgive us. We lay our sin at your feet and we ask you to take it from us. Would you make us white as snow when we walk out of here? Even though it's Florida, Lord God, would you make us white as snow? Father, would you do something in our hearts that we would just acknowledge the beauty of your forgiveness and your saving grace? Would it cause us to desire to put verses like Deuteronomy chapter 6 into place in our life? Where out of the gratitude and love of our heart, we remember you each and every day. We put you first. Father, we live it out and we pass it on to the next generation. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We give you glory today in Jesus' name. And everybody says, would you put your hands together in honor of those who surrender their life to God today? If that's you and you raised your hand, we don't want to leave you where you're at. We would love to give you some information to help you with us, you know, just start a new walk of faith. Please, there's people up here at the front that would love to give you some next steps. So if you're a family member with them, bring them up here and get them some next steps. If you're new to Journey Church, go stop by our next step station as well, where they have a gift for you as our way of saying thank you. From my family to yours, Merry Christmas. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.